Salt makes food taste good, but could it shorten your life? Stay tuned for Health Politics. Welcome to Health Politics with Dr. Mike McGee, a weekly program exploring important trends in health. In this day and age, you're probably well aware that you're supposed to be mindful of how much salt you're eating. But as it turns out, being truly aware of your salt intake takes a lot more effort than simply removing the salt shaker from your dinner table. The average American consumes two to three times as much salt as she or he should on a daily basis, and only 15% of that comes from the salt shaker. About 10% occurs naturally in foods, and a whopping 75% is put there by the food industry. That's why it's important for consumers to know exactly what they're getting themselves into each time they pop open a can of soup or sit down in a restaurant. Excessive salt intake leads to high blood pressure, and high blood pressure, which leads to cardiovascular disease, is both silent and deadly. In all fairness, we do need some salt, usually referred to as sodium on food labels, in order to survive. Sodium performs several important functions in the body. First, it helps maintain body fluid concentration levels, since water is drawn to sodium. Second, it's essential for normal electrical conduction along our nerve pathways. And third, it assists in the body's uptake of nutrients. All of this can be done with about a half a gram of sodium a day. But as I mentioned, most Americans are taking in much more than that about four grams, in fact, and many probably don't even realize it. The food industry adds salt to everything, from breakfast cereals to cheeses. Why? Because we consumers have developed a taste for it. We tend to buy foods that are high in sodium, and we shun those that are not. Other reasons on top of this include the fact that salt is a relatively inexpensive additive. It has some preservative qualities. It adds texture to the food, and it covers up a few bad tastes that are byproducts of food processing itself. But with one gram in some cans of soup, two grams in some frozen TV dinners, and many restaurant meals serving up four grams of sodium, you can see how easy it is to take in too much and why so many of us need to be careful. Understanding the connection between sodium high blood pressure, and cardiovascular disease is key. To put it simply, high blood pressure causes cardiovascular disease, and cardiovascular disease leads to heart attacks and strokes. How? High blood pressure is, in part, the result of too much blood volume in our circulatory systems. When sodium levels are high, the concentrated mineral draws in more water and expands our blood volume. That volume must be pumped through the blood channels, putting extra stress on the heart. The volume itself creates expansion pressure on the vessels, stressing weak points which can occasionally rupture. If this occurs in a blood vessel in the brain, a stroke is the result. Who's at risk? Approximately 30% of the U.S. population has high blood pressure, which is a reading of 140 over 90 or greater. And high blood pressure causes about half of the deaths from cardiovascular disease worldwide. Age and race can increase that risk. Nearly 70% of Americans over age 80 have high blood pressure, compared to just 10% between ages 30 and 39. African Americans are 40% more likely than whites to suffer from high blood pressure, and they're 50% more likely to die of heart disease and 80% more likely to die from a stroke. That's why it's recommended that seniors and African Americans of all ages consume no more than 1.5 grams of sodium a day compared to the 2.3 grams a day recommended for the rest of the population. In fact, adhering to these recommended amounts over the next 10 years would save approximately 150,000 lives per year. But considering how common salt is in our food supply, that's a tall order. Currently, the Food and Drug Administration's generally recognized as safe status on salt allows it to be added without controls and oversight to our food. That's why in June of 2006, 
the American Medical Association urged the FDA to revoke that status and begin regulating salt as a food additive. Of course, that would not be an inconsequential battle for the FDA's Center for Food Safety and Applied Nutrition, whose budget has been cut nearly in half over the past four years, from $47 million to $25 million. If the recommendation were adopted, packaged food companies would not only be required to stick to certain sodium levels for various categories of food, but also speed up the search for an alternative to salt as a preservative and a flavor enhancer. Now to give credit where credit is due, some food manufacturers are trying and we the consumers are not exactly cooperating. For example, ConAgra's versions of low sodium healthy choice chicken noodle soup and low sodium hamburger helper went down in defeat. No buyers. But there is some good news on the front. The products from which the company has more quietly reduced sodium are doing quite well, including Kids Cuisine, Chef Boyardee, and Banquet Frozen Dinners. So what can we do to take more control of our own sodium intake? First, read the labels. Total intake per day of sodium should not exceed 2.3 grams, except for African Americans and the elderly who should only consume 1.5 grams a day. Any food with a half a gram or more in a portion is probably worth avoiding. Second, watch the restaurants. A single meal often contains four grams of sodium. And think twice about that free bread on the table. It's one of the worst offenders. Third, remove the salt shaker from your table at home. Why add insult to injury? Fourth, accept a little pain. Studies show we like the taste of salt and weaning ourselves off it will be noticeable at first. But studies also show that adjusting to the change happens quickly and cravings disappear rapidly. Making the small sacrifice is well worth it. Cutting your sodium intake in half can drop your blood pressure five points and that decreases your risk of death from heart disease by 9% and from stroke by 14%. For Health Politics, I'm Mike McGee. Thank you for watching Health Politics with Dr. Mike McGee. For more information on this topic, please visit our related web links, discussion guide, or downloadable transcript and slides. For videos and information on a variety of other health topics, visit our homepage at healthpolitics.org. If you would like to subscribe to our free weekly video, click on subscribe to Health Politics and enter your email address. Again, thank you for watching.